support that I feel from the greater community, not only the astrophysics community, but the space-faring engineering community when I'm doing my job trying to bring the frontier of science to the public. It, didn't, it doesn't have to be that way, obviously, because there's no reason that you should respect anything I do. I'm just another person out there. But the fact that I do feel this respect, and assuming that it's real, uh, it means that uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vote of confidence that what I am doing is for our collective greater good. Greater good. And so I just want to first tell you that I not only feel it, but I, I deeply appreciate it, and I don't forget it when, when it happens first. Second, um, generally, uh, you, you don't see me specifically endorsing one mission or another, or one kind of architecture, or one kind of launch vehicle. Um, I try to keep my messages higher than that in a way that would float all boats. Uh, what I found is that the, the sort of the deeper you go, the more susceptible you are to getting a rock thrown at you uh, <laughs> by one camp or another. And some of that's necessary, you know, rock throwing that can happen. Uh, and it can happen at political level, it can occasionally happen scientifically, it can happen from center to center. You know, these are sort of the normal uh, human behavior in the face of limited resources. Uh, so I try to stay above that. What occasionally happens is, as what happened in my most recent appearance on Bill Maher, which in fact was August, uh, I'm there just talking about science literacy and, and the value of NASA as an enterprise, and he specifically mentioned JWST. Well, if he's going to specifically put it on the table, then I'm, uh, I'll take it and run with it. But I didn't start my conversation with any one mission or another. So what the way this will happen then in, in practice is... There's some Kepler discovery that's up there, and it's like in, it's it's embedded in our culture of conversation about what the latest discoveries are. Then it's a natural element of the conversation. They'll say, "Well, what's the latest that's going on out there?" Well, Kepler, we got some planets, and we got an Earth size, and and what drives it is, of course, it, it, our interest in finding anybody out there like us, you know, in any kind of is the planet the same size, is it water, continents, we. We're, we're pushing the frontier of our curiosity. And Kepler is one cog in this wheel that we're trying to keep turning here, uh, not only at NASA, but for the country at large. And so uh, I don't get big-headed about it. I, I, my office is 10 blocks north of all the major news-gathering headquarters of the country. So I'm just an easy date for this. <laughs> 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 no, the universe flinches. And they need a sound bite. Uh, I'm going to be back in my office Monday. I will surely get phone calls on your Monday announcement. And so uh, this is actually quite nicely timed for just that. Uh, there's my next schedule appearance on uh, uh, big appearance, I suppose. Next, there can be big appearances that are unscheduled, like if something blows up, that like, they call me in. Fine. But <laughs> stuff we know well in advance, one of them uh, on February 27th, I'm going to be on John Stewart. And... Uh, about 15% of these encounters are driven by something that I did that has marketing people associated with it. 85%, I'm happy to report, are because they're just curious <laughs> and they want the easy date for me to just take a cab ride in. The 15% where it's driven by something I did, on that day is a book that I'm releasing. And the original title which, upon submission to the publisher, they immediately just nixed it. They said it was too depressing. Okay? <laughs> the original title was Failure to Launch <laughs> The Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. <laughs> they said, no, we can't have that. It's got, it's got the word failure in it, you know? And the book is about this perennial mismatch between where we always thought we'd be in space and where we ultimately ended up being. You know, it was, it was in the 60s. We said, oh, by the 1980s, we'll have colonies on Mars. By 2000, you know, thousands of people will be living and working in space. And there's always been a mismatch there, and I don't think that's been properly analyzed or properly explored. 
So this book, which got renamed to Space Chronicles, it's every thought I've ever had about our past, present, and future in space. I'm mentioning this to you because when the book comes out, there's an entire media circus that rises up around that because it's been solicited from the media. All right? The book has been handed to the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and all of these talk shows. So I'm going to bubble up from my office and over those weeks that surround it, and they're going to ask me about NASA because that's what the freaking book is about. <laughs> so, so it's an occasion to make NASA at the front of the news for a point where constructive commentary can unfold. And because without the book, then it has to sort of come up on its own, and it doesn't always do that, and it competes with other uh, other news uh, news stories. And so uh, that's what will happen over these next couple of months. And I'm happy to say, if you didn't hear officially, but was announced in my introduction, it is real. Uh, we are actually, have already begun, right now we're scripting and ready to go into production for a 21st century version of Cosmos. Yeah. And it's since that last one appeared, 1980. And what was remarkable about that original Cosmos was you don't remember any other documentary from 30 years ago, but you remember Cosmos. And this is an awesome responsibility to take on this task. And I want you to trust that we are, we are analyzing in detail the elements of that original series that meant the most to people why that rose above the din of documentaries that came before and have come since. And we are, in a way, sifting from the mixture of content that was back then, and we're taking the stuff that worked best and bringing that into the 21st century. And we're really leaving behind the things that either we don't need anymore, because in co the original Cosmos there was a lot of uh, time given to just basic science basic discoveries. Well, you don't need that anymore because every night you can tune in to somebody's documentary on the universe. There's Wonders of the Universe from Brian Cox over from the UK that was uh, acquired by Discovery Channel. Even Morgan Freeman's got a show. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, what's that one called? Through the, through the Wormhole. So people have shows. So Cosmos now does not have to be the deliverer of encyclopedic information. And it can focus on all the aspects of cosmic discovery that upon viewing an episode, you then take it to heart. It's science as it means something to you, rather than simply science as just the conveyance of a cool discovery. And it's the meaning of science that is the hallmark of cosmos. And that's what we're trying to bring forward. And just to disavow you of any uh, odd thoughts uh, about where the series will land, it will not be on PBS. It, in fact, will appear in prime time on Fox. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So now, what is this? So now, so, so, uh, so I, I tweeted this, right? And there are these responses, Fox? They don't know any science on Fox. Why do you? What? And I said, that's why. Uh, don't confuse what uh, people don't know with what they, at the end of the day, should end up knowing. And so the real, what you're really asking whether or not you have asked, what you're really thinking is, <laughs> will we have the freedom to retain the scientific integrity that we know that franchise deserves? And the answer to that is, in, is, in, is simply yes. And what it came down to was meetings with the, the, the higher-ups where what it came down to is, it was, well, we don't know how to make a documentary, and if there's going to be anything like the original Cosmos, Go ahead. <laughs> that's kind of what that con I mean, I, I paraphrase. But I paraphrase, but that's kind of how that conversation went. And so uh, that's why we're proceeding with tremendous confidence that it'll be exactly the product that we want. And in a network that has the greatest number of demographic TV viewers intersecting those channels, from the conservative commentary of Fox News to the liberal acerbic commentary that you get in, in The Simpsons. Simpsons is on Fox. Fox has the number one show in television, which is American Idol. It has critically acclaimed dramas. 24 was a Fox series, so is House and Fringe. Uh, it has Glee. 
These are, these are huge, successful products of an enterprise. And not all the same people watch all of those products, but they all cross in to that network. And so I could think of no better place to put it with a, an audience that will be anywhere between 10 and 50 times what it would have been had it gone back to PBS. So this is, that's the state of the universe at the moment. And, uh, oh, so uh, we're scripting now. We film next year. And the goal is, it, is for it to uh, air in the spring of 2013. Yes, 2013. <laughs> so, so thank you for your warmth and hospitality. And I, I guess the food and wine is still outside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a small presentation. Oh, okay. And this is for you, Neil. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the Texas spacecraft. Oh, this is a bow. Yeah. This is okay. Yes, okay. And of course, we want you to display this probably. Oh my goodness! Well, thank you. It's signed by just about everybody on the Kepler team. Just about everybody. Yeah, I think we've got everybody. I hope so. <laughs> just about. Yeah, everybody. Those are not crap. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we know that you are a wine connoisseur. Well, I just like when the wine is good. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be a connoisseur. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is that too much to ask? Probably what we have today is not Okay. <laughs> but these are two Kepler wine glasses. Kepler wine glasses? Excellent. Uh, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to have to show you some pictures of these. Did you have any question of me about this project? Oh, too yeah. many. Uh, just to, uh, pick, to pick up on this, we opened this exhibit in New York. Uh, beyond planet Earth, and it's a celebration not simply of what has happened in the past, which I think there's been too much of. Uh, it's a really a forward-looking exhibit, trying to get people dreaming again about what the future of space might be. And this is not out of our... our uh, it actually has historical precedent. Some of you may know, if you, if you look this up, that there was a series of articles on space in the early 1950s that appeared in Collier's magazine mm -hmm. that had artists' representations of the best engineering and space science thinking about how we might go into space. It was a series of them. And it's what put uh, Chesley Bonstell on the map as a great space artist. And these were all informed by the latest research of Werner von Braun. The journalist who wrote those articles wrote it because it was an account of a conference that was held at the Hayden Planetarium, a series of conferences in 1952 and 1953. So we have a kind of a responsibility to sort of get back into that, into that dialogue, or at least to force some kind of conversation to, to, to happen so that uh, NASA can get back on track and we can start dreaming again. So uh, you're in New York, just holler. Uh, if, if I'm not there because I travel a lot, I'll make sure we leave some tickets for you. Uh, and uh, make sure you hit that exhibit. Thank you. Okay.